Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're working on this Troy Built Junior Tiller. Uh, this model was made in the mid 80s in Troy, New York. It is a very well built machine and definitely worth saving. Uh, powering it is a three horse Tecumseh engine. And despite all the dirt and grime, you know, I don't think this thing has seen a lot of action. You know, this shield here is almost always bent and beaten up and this one looks brand new. Anyway, I'm told it runs, or at least it did run. It's been a few years. Uh, this one was actually given to the channel by Stanley and he got it from a friend who no longer had any use for it. You know, Stanley was hoping to put it to work in his yard and once he got it, you know, he saw it was really too big for his needs. So he passed it on to us. So thank you, Stanley, for that. Anyway, before getting this up on the lift, you know, it's pretty dirty. So I'm going to give it a quick pressure wash and then we'll get it up on the lift and get going on it. cleaned up really well. Hopefully it'll run as good as it looks, uh, but that I do have doubts. Uh, Stanley said he had this running about a year ago, but it was really hard to start. So potentially it's just a carb or fuel delivery issue, uh, but I'm not so sure. You know, after pulling it over, you know, I can feel that we have compression, but we also have high leak down. Like it should hold that compression and instead it just advances right through it. So we might have issues with the valves, you know, potentially valve clearance, or maybe we just got a little bit of rust on the valves. And if that's the case, once it runs for a little while, that might clear up. You know, if it doesn't, then I'm thinking valve clearance, or maybe we have some bigger issues. So I think I'm gonna start just by pulling the plug. We'll do a compression test, see where it's at. And if all looks good, We'll just dig into that carb. All 
All right, let's see what this one comes in at. Now, I don't know what it should be on this engine. Usually, most engines I test, it's around 60 PSI, uh, but those are ones with a decompression system. You know, this engine, I don't think has that. So if it doesn't, you know, I would expect to see closer to 100. So let's pull it over a few times. We'll open up the choke. Throttle is already open. Okay, and we're at about 75 PSI. So it'll run. And if we have a decompression system, then that actually is great compression. If we don't, then yeah, that's not so good. So I'm gonna have to look that up, but I'd say for now, it should at least start with that kind of compression. Beautiful. No issues jumping that quarter inch gap. So we have nice, strong spark. So we've got spark. We've got compression. Uh, do we have fuel? And I would say no. There is something on the bottom of the tank, but I'm thinking that is likely water from the pressure washer. So I'm going to leave the cap off for now. We'll just let that dry out. So I'm thinking instead we can just pull the line from the bottom of the tank, feed it some fuel that way, and we'll try to start it. This line is absolutely petrified, so it does need to be replaced. Uh, but for now, should be fine to test with. No, this isn't gonna work. The line up at the top, it's all stretched out. It's not gonna hold the barb. And from there down, it's completely petrified and the barb won't go in. So I'm thinking instead, I'm just gonna cut the line off on the carb side. We'll attach this directly to the carb. Just get this clamp out of the way. And I'm gonna push the line partially back through. Now this Tigon line, it is great stuff, but you really shouldn't use it in areas where there's high heat. And this line goes directly against the head. You know, this has a much lower melting point than traditional fuel lines. So if it's gonna be hot, you know, I wouldn't use that type of line. It's taking fuel. So that's a good sign. Hopefully the needle works. We'll find out in a minute if we start flooding over. And I think we are going to flood over. It's taking a lot of fuel. Yep, we're flooding over. So I'm going to stop adding fuel. Probably leave the choke open and try to start it like this. That's a bunch of corrosion here. So I'm going to wire wheel that real quick and just get some of that off.
let's check the oil real quick before trying to start it. And yeah, plenty of oil uh, to test with. I'm sure it needs to be changed, but yeah, let's hear the engine run first. Okay, well, maybe this will be an easy one. You know, it started first pull, uh, the engine sounded good, and I could kind of rev it up. You know, it actually seemed to over rev for a second, and then it stalled out. So I had assumed it ran out of fuel, so I just refilled it, and it actually didn't take much. And this time the needle and seat seemed to be working. So I'm gonna try to restart it, just play around with the throttle a little bit. You know, I am concerned actually about it because I noticed the governor arm is really loose. You know, so maybe we have a broken governor inside of that engine. Also, this governor rod, I'm pretty sure Stanley made that. Uh, he did lose the original, but he actually found it and dropped it off. So we might actually need to swap this out if we have problems with the engine speed, but the one that he made seems to be the right length. So yeah, let's, let's try to restart it. I wanna play around with the throttle. I wanna see if I can feel the governor pushing back, you know, trying to slow down the engine. I take back what I said. I don't think this one's gonna be an easy one. Pretty sure the governor is not working at all. So there's two possibilities. Either it's broken inside the engine and given the way this arm moves, I'm leaning towards that. Or potentially, you know, the governor's out of adjustment, meaning we have to reset it. So I'm gonna get off this part of the air box. I'm actually gonna remove these bolts that hold the carb on. You know, I wanna disconnect the linkage, hold this in the wide open throttle position and just see if the bend right here, you know, corresponds with wide open throttle on that carburetor. Actually, before I pull this carburetor off, I'm gonna start it one more time. You know, I wanna test the functions of the tiller, make sure that the tines engage, that the drive wheels work. You know, I wanna make sure the tiller part's good because it looks like we're gonna to have to spend some time fixing this engine. And I don't wanna do that just to find out we don't have a viable machine.
Well, the tiller seems to work. You know, I guess it's hard to know for sure until we put it to work, but no red flags there. So we'll set the airbox base off, out of the way. You know, that does need to be probably soaked in some evaporust. Uh, but for now, let's figure out this issue. Pretty sure these bolts are on backwards, especially since this one won't clear without removing the entire intake manifold. Anyway, let's pop this out. We'll hold this in position, move it to wide open throttle. And actually, this is spring loaded. So what I thought was the governor pushing back was actually that spring right there which explains why once you give it some throttle, it never slows down. So, yeah. Well, it seems like we're out of adjustment, right? Because in full throttle, if I move this arm all the way to the right, where it stops, that bend should align with that hole. And we're off by half an inch maybe a little more. So like that, the governor absolutely would not work. So I guess the question is, why is it so far off? Is it because the internals are broken? Or did someone make an adjustment improperly? So yeah, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to loosen up things down here. We'll reset the calibration and we'll try this again. So before we make the adjustment, I'm going to swap out the governor rod to the OEM one. And actually like that, this other end isn't going to hook onto the carb. So we need to rotate that 180 degrees, put it on through the far side like that. And let's also get this bolt out. You know, it should be installed the other way. So assuming we can get it out, we'll install it like that instead. So to make this adjustment, it's actually pretty straightforward on this engine. You just loosen up this bolt right here. And once that's loose, the governor arm is allowed to pivot in the middle. We're actually still a little tight. So I'm going to loosen it just a bit more. So the bottom part and the top part of the shaft now move separately. So I'm going to hold the top in the wide open throttle position. So that is to the right, which is clockwise. And I'm gonna pivot this until it stops turning, which is right there. So now we're in the full throttle position. This shaft has been rotated as far as it can to the right until the throttle plate stopped it. So like that, we should be calibrated. So let's try starting this again and see if this governor shows any signs of slowing that engine down. So let's do the same test we did earlier. I'm gonna add some spring tension until this 
starts to open up. So right there, we're at about actually two thirds throttle. Let's back that off just a bit. Yeah, let's give that a try. So if the governor's working at all, as soon as the engine gets up to speed, the governor should close the throttle plate up against that idle set screw. And there's barely any spring tension right now. So if it can't close that, then we have bigger issues. So yeah, let's give it a try. Let's see what we get. Now it doesn't want to start. I just opened up the main jet. One full turn. Let's try this again. Okay, well, the carb's not working too well anymore, but the governor did close that throttle plate. So I'll try it again, this time full spring tension. So the throttle plate is in wide open throttle. And assuming we can get this carb to work one more time, we'll see if we can get the engine up to speed and if the governor can close that throttle plate. Beautiful. Yeah, I think we dodged a bullet on this one. I thought for sure the governor was broken inside the engine given how sloppy that arm is and the fact that the engine was over revving. But as it turns out, it was just misadjusted because this time we started it at max spring tension and in the wide open throttle position. And as soon as the engine came up to speed, the governor inside the engine had no problems closing that throttle plate right against the idle set screw. So the governor, it's not an issue. Uh, the carburetor though is becoming an issue. You know, when we first started this machine, it actually ran quite well on this carb. And now it's becoming increasingly difficult to start the engine and keep it going. So we definitely need to go through that. But before we do that, you know, let's get that oil changed while it's hot. Yeah, it's a good thing we're changing that oil. I mean, there's no metallic in there, but it's well-used oil. And for a tiller, you know, that gets used maybe once a year. You know, this oil, I'd say, has been in there for quite a long time. Let's just see what comes out of here. You know, this carb, I'm not sure when it was last cleaned. And it was running really well. So I'm thinking just a bunch of debris may have broken off. So yeah, actually not much left in the bowl. A bit of water, a bit of debris. Things look pretty clean, at least on this part right here. So let's get the carb fully off. We'll open it up and just clean it out. So 
So we'll get this needle out. Usually I turn it in first to see where it's set at, but I was playing around with it so much. I'm actually not sure where we started. You know, we were about four turns out in the end, which is too much. So I think we do have a blockage somewhere. Uh, this is the pilot jet, and it's also a needle. So let's see where this one's at. There's half. One, just a touch over one. And there's a washer in there. Let me try to pick that out before we lose it. There's the washer. And there's also an O-ring. Which doesn't want to come out, so I'm not going to force it. You know, I do like taking kind of all the rubber parts off before running it through the ultrasonic because the cleaner I use can cause issues. And yeah, I think we found the issue right here. This looks to be all water. So that alone would cause the carb to run pretty poorly. And as we saw, it was running well in the beginning, not so much toward the end. So I'm not really sure why that would be. You know, the fuel I added didn't have water in it. So yeah, I wonder where that water came from. And we'll dump that out. You can see just about all water. Then on the carb body, there's not a whole lot here. Uh, this pin comes out. It is rusted, though. So might need to tap that just a bit. That's pretty much it. So the carb doesn't look that bad. I think, you know, the water is why it was running the way that it was toward the end. So yeah, potentially the pressure washer may have gotten the water in there, but it doesn't explain why it ran so well in the beginning and then went downhill. Anyway, I'm gonna spray this out. We'll get kind of all this junk out of here, go through all the passages, make sure they're clear. I give it a soak in the ultrasonic and we'll put it together. See how it works. It's tempting to spray through here with some carb spray, uh, but we do have neoprene O-rings around this emulsion tube, which it is removable, but usually on these carbs, that is not a problem. So I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, we also have a neoprene seat down there. And of course, we have this O-ring here, which isn't coming out. So I'm not going to use any carb spray. You know, I think I will get maybe the Dremel and just see if we can't knock off some of this corrosion.
It's very hard to see, but there is a side passage right there. And if that's clogged, things aren't going to run right. Uh, but so far, I haven't found anything preventing this from running other than the water. So all the passages are clear. Uh, but even with clear passages, these passages, they're too small. There's not enough vacuum. It can't pull the water through. So usually when you have water in the carb, it won't run at all. So let's soak this, put it back together, see what we get. We'll put a little bit of evaporust in here and just let it soak overnight. And with any luck in the morning, it'll look like a new part. Cleaned up really nice. So let's get it back together. I guess starting with the bowl gasket. And then the needle and float. Now I didn't check the float height before taking this apart. So we'll double check it now. It should be roughly parallel with the body of the carb. That looks pretty good actually. So we'll get the bowl on this side right here where the line is should correspond to the hinge on the float. You know, if you don't align it properly, uh, the float isn't gonna do its thing properly. So we'll get this snugged down and we'll reset the needle for the main jet to one and a half turns. That is the initial setting. And the pilot needle one turn is the initial setting. We were just a touch over, so I'll set it back to how it was. So we are lightly seated right there. So we'll do one and a half. And for the pilot needle, we'll put this washer back. Let's make sure the O-ring is still there, and I do see it. And we'll lightly bottom this one out, and we'll back it out just over a turn. All right, right there, we're bottomed out. There's half, one, Okay, let's try it out. Before we get the carb on, let's run the new line if we can, you know, behind the flywheel, kind of sandwiched between the head. So usually you have to take this blower housing off to do it. I'm gonna try to cheat and see if we can fish this through. This is just quarter inch line, uh, but the outer diameter, it's a little bit thinner than most quarter inch line. This is seven sixteenths and you really need something no larger than 7 16 to fit between the flywheel and the head. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting it quite a bit. So let's see if we can fish this through without pulling the blower housing. If it ends up being too much trouble, we'll just remove four bolts, fish this through, and then get the carb installed.
And ideally, I'd add a fuel filter here and a shutoff valve. And I don't think I have a whole lot of room to do that. Uh, but if I use like a 90 degree valve, yeah, I should be able to get away with that. You know, the fuel filter. We might be able to fit one. We'll try it. I think it'll work. We just need to shorten this maybe by half an inch. So far, so good. The fuel valve is on and we are not leaking. I've got the throttle about halfway. So I'm going to try to start it. And once it's started, you know, I'll likely bring the throttle down, you know, tweak this pilot needle a bit, and then I'll bring the throttle all the way up and make some minor adjustments to that main jet. Sounds pretty good.
It's amazing the difference a clean car makes. It took a few pulls to start, but once it started, it ran great. You know, I fine-tuned the pilot needle just a bit, and then I brought the idle down, really as far as I could get it, which was about 1,000 RPM. So that is pretty impressive. Most engines I work on cannot idle that low and sound as good as this. This thing was just purring like a kitten. Anyway, I wanna say we're done with the engine, but there's one more issue to sort out. When I bring it to full throttle, we're only getting about 2,400 RPM out of this machine, and I would expect at least 3,000, if not 3,600. So there is an adjustment right here. You know, if I drive that in, that will increase the spring tension under full throttle. So I'm gonna restart it, We'll try to make that adjustment and see if we can get the speed we need out of this governor spring. I think that did it. You know, I did have to max out the adjustment, but once I did, we got up to about 3,300 RPM, which I think will be fine. You know, if we do need more engine speed, I think the next move would just be to shorten the spring a little bit. You know, if we did that, we could then back off this adjustment and likely get uh, the additional speed. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna call that good. You know, the engine, I think, is 100%. You know, I just need to wait for this backing plate to finish in the evaporust. Once that's done, we'll get that back on. I also have the airbox cover as well as the filter. So we'll wait for the evaporust to do its thing. And while waiting for that, you know, I do want to turn my attention to the transmission. You know, I haven't checked the level of the oil. You know, I'm sure that oil is old and needs to be changed. But before I even do that, you know, I noticed there is one seal that's leaking. You know, it's kind of hard to see, but it's right back there behind these tines. So to get that seal changed, I'm gonna have to remove this hub. And well, it's been on there for 40 years. So I'm hoping this oil leak might work in our favor. So there is one through bolt right there. You know, I'm gonna get that out and we'll see if this is gonna wanna play nice.
bolts out. So theoretically, this should just slide right off. And no, it is rusted in place. So, yeah, potentially a puller. And yeah, I don't want to pull too hard because I might bend the tines, but let's just try a puller. Apply a bit of pressure, see if that's enough. I think we're getting lucky on this one. It's coming off. Need a longer bolt. Just a bit of WD-40 works really well for cleaning up oily messes. All right, I think that's enough for now. I don't actually have the seal yet. You know, I didn't want to order it until I knew I could get this piece off. So I'm going to place an order. I'm sure that's going to take a few days. So while we're waiting for that, let's just pop the cap off kind of the gearbox, see if we have any oil. And actually, there is a plug on the other side here. So we can pull that, just check if there's any water in here. And we can do the same on the drive wheels. I'm gonna try to get this side off too. We don't need to, this seal isn't leaking, but if it's not already stuck on, you know, I do wanna get some anti-seize on there. Plus it'll give us easier access to that drain bolt. This one's coming off too. I am shocked. Just going to take a little sample to start with. 
you know, if there's water in here, it's going to be in the bottom. And yeah, that's, that's what I was afraid of. There is water. So let me see if I can get the water out. Hoping it's not all water. Okay, and we have some oil. So I'm gonna do the same to the drive wheels. I mean, really, I need to drain the whole system anyway to change the seal. Uh, but for now, I really just wanna get the water out. I don't want that in there any longer than it needs to be. Let's see what we have up here. So with both tines off and one wheel off, this the whole thing's pretty unstable. And we don't have a whole lot of room to get this wrench on here. It is turning. Yep, more water up here too. So these machines, if they're left outside, this is what happens. And we don't have any oil. So this side of the machine, it's actually higher actually lower than the back. So I'm surprised we're not getting any oil out of here. We must have, must have leaked most of it out of that back seal. Oh, actually, no, there is oil in there. I think it's just really thick oil. It's been 24 hours and I just placed an order for the new oil seal. It should be here in about a week, uh, but I don't want to remove this one quite yet. You know, I'm not 100% sure that it's the right part. And although this machine's in great shape, you know, all the labels are perfectly legible. The most important label, the one that has the exact model and serial number is, well, no longer with us. You know, I can't make anything out on it. And there are seven revisions of this machine. So, you know, although I think I ordered the right seal, it's a bit of a guessing game. So we will leave that in place until we're sure 
we have a replacement. Anyway, while we wait for that, there are a few things we can do. You know, I think starting with the airbox, I want to get that back together. You know, the Evaporust has worked its magic. So we will get the backing plate on as well as the rest of the airbox and move on. So oddly enough, I don't have a gasket for this airbox. You know, I searched all the spares I have and none of them are even remotely close. So we do need to make one. So the way I do that is just with a piece of paper and a crayon. This is gonna make a template that we can then transfer to the gasket material. And it also allows me to save this template. So if I need another copy in the future, you know, I can just grab this out of the bag and make another. Now, it doesn't have to be precise. I think the important thing is that the hole in the middle is at least as big as the hole in the carburetor. You don't want to restrict the airflow. So I already measured this out. It's a touch over an inch, and I have a punch that is actually an inch and an eighth. So it's going to be a little bit oversized, but as long as it isn't too big, you know, we'll still have a surface to seal on. Plus, this is the airbox side. It's not super critical that it's perfect. So let's punch this out. Okay. So that is pretty good. And then we just need the holes right there for the screws. So I just use a hole punch. Now it's going to make a hole that's too big, which is fine. You know, as long as again, we have a little seal right here. You know, we should be in business. So I'm going to punch that right there. Put another one right there. And that's pretty close. I think that'll do. Yeah, that should be fine. And then as far as the outer shape, it actually doesn't matter a whole lot, you know, if you match this shape exactly. So I'm going to leave the bottom alone. It's already pretty tight. We'll just cut some of the excess off. And now we have our template. Yep, we're looking pretty good. Perfect. Yeah, I'm noticing the throat of this car, but it is actually smaller than an inch. So the carb I used as the template wasn't the best template, although the screw holes do line up. And the diameter of this hole is actually an inch, like that other carburetor. So I don't think it's an issue that this gasket is a little bit smaller since the backing plate is actually larger, like the other carb we used as the template.
I found the manual for this tiller and in the specifications, it mentions that it should be at 3000 RPM. And the last time I had this running, I brought it up to about 3300. So I'm gonna back off this screw a bit, restart it and just fine tune that adjustment, uh, bringing it back to 3000 RPM. I'm gonna pull these drain bolts again. You know, this stuff is so thick. It's probably best that it is given a good day or so to drain out. And the other thing I'm noticing too is that both of these have a fill plug right here. So basically there's a fill plug on this differential or this gearbox as well as the one on the front. So we can remove those plugs and when it gets to that point, we'll just fill things up until it starts to come out. And then we know we're full. Well, I gave it a day, but in reality, it only needed a few minutes. Not a whole lot came out of this gearbox. And to say that it's a concern would be an understatement. You know, this is supposed to have 57 fluid ounces of gear oil in there. And to put that into perspective, it should have been enough to fill this two liter bottle about to the 85% mark. And instead we have Virtually nothing. You know, I think I got more water out of there than actual oil. So I guess the question is, what happened to the oil? I mean, I know we had a leak, but this is a very slow leak. I mean, it would have taken decades to get to the point where we are now. So yeah, hopefully this wasn't run a lot with the water and the lack of oil. You know, thankfully it still works, but yeah, I'm sure it didn't do the gearbox any favors. Just gonna clean these up a little bit and grease them up. And we'll get the wheels back on. I don't think we're gonna need to take them off again. I mean, potentially we will. That is the kind of the overfill plug. But I can just measure out the amount of oil and not worry so much about that.
There's really one last thing to do while waiting, and that's just to double check the head bolt torque. Uh, these bolts, they tend to stretch out over time, especially the ones near the exhaust. So it is a good idea to double check them periodically to make sure they're still up to spec. So I'm gonna start here, work my way around counterclockwise, and these I would expect should be close to spec, and likely these three are gonna turn and likely not torqued anymore to where they should be. All right, that one's good. 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 Yep, so far nothing's turned. Yeah, this one is turning a little. There we go. So is this one. And that one's turning too. So they weren't super loose, but these three were definitely kind of under torqued. And now we know for sure they're good. The tiller came with a box of parts, mostly containing the parts for the air box and the cover for the belts. But in the bottom, I just realized we have the original documentation that came with this machine, including a parts catalog dated October 1985. So I flipped through here, just wanted to double check that I ordered the right seal. And according to this, looks like I did. We need number six, shown on the parts diagram, which is part 9613. And that's what I ordered. So that is good news. We should have the right part in a few days. Uh, we also have the original no time limit warranty. So technically this 40 year old machine is under warranty. Got some phone numbers to call for service and some important reminders like check the engine and transmission oil. So I assume back in 1985, the transmission was full, at least I hope it was. And then we have this nice little maintenance record. So it tells you at what intervals to do what, including every 30 hours, check transmission, every 40 hours, check engine screws and bolts, like we just did on the head. And on the back side, you know, it gives a little bit of information on each, like check for transmission gear oil leaks, check transmission oil level, and check the bolts, like the head bolts. So yeah, pretty cool that someone held on to this for 40 years. And I mean, really all this documentation looks brand new. So yeah, someone definitely cared for this machine. Anyway, it'll be a few days yet before we get the new seal. So I'm going to turn the camera off for now. And in a second, hopefully I'll be installing that seal. And the new seals showed up today. I got two of them. So the plan is to get this one swapped out first. This is the one that we know 100% is leaking. And if I mess up installing the new seal, I have a backup. Uh, if things go well, then I'll likely use the extra seal for the other side. So I'm going to use a drill bit to put a hole kind of right in the middle of the seal. I want to be very careful not to nick the shaft, especially, uh, but you don't want to nick either side if possible. So once we have that pilot hole, we'll just put a screw in that hole to grab a hold of it and use a slide hammer to pull it out. I'm not sure that's gonna work. The bit kind of cut in pretty close to the shaft. Now we'll give it a try. Worst case, we can go somewhere else.
Nope. There we go. Well, kind of. Actually, that metal shell, that is part of the seal. We only got the rubber part of the seal, so let me pick at that, see if that'll come out. Well, it's out. Definitely more of a fight than I thought going into it. It came out in about four pieces, uh, but it is 100% out. So I'm going to spend a second, just clean up these sealing surfaces, and we'll get the new seal installed. And there are some scratches here on the shaft, which might cause the new seal to leak. Although... You know, majority of that seal is going to be sitting in further. And that part of the shaft actually looks fine. So I think we'll be okay. should do. Well, aside from the difficulty of getting the old one out, uh, the new one installed quite well. And now that I'm looking at this other one over here, and actually the one I just pulled was the same way, you know, this seal is not fully installed. So I'm not sure if someone did that on purpose, like potentially I drove that one in too far, or maybe, you know, the water froze, potentially pushing that out a little. I'm not sure, uh, but given the condition of the shaft, you know, I think it makes sense to drive that seal in further, especially since we're not up against the ball bearing. There is plenty of room there. So I'm going to try the same on this. We'll get this one replaced. Uh, this time, though, I'm going to drill in a little bit deeper. I think that was my mistake last time. I only drilled in enough to catch this metal, uh, but not actually the seal. So... Yeah, we'll try going a little deeper this time, and hopefully it comes out the first shot.
So we are two for two. And I was about to say, let's fill it up with oil and check for leaks. You know, there's no evidence of leaks over here on the drive wheel shaft. Uh, so we are good there. But there's one more shaft, which I forgot to look at. And that is the main input shaft where the pulley is attached. And you can see that whole area is just covered in oil. So I'm thinking we have a leak with that oil seal as well. So to get access to that, we do need to pull off this bottom plate and then try to remove that pulley from the input shaft. So what do you think the odds are? This is just gonna come right off. Look at that. <laughs> Boy, I got lucky. So let's get this belt out of the way and then this pulley looks like it's gonna come right out. Nice. And that's the seal in question right there. And I think it is leaking because it is, it's all oily right there. It's oily underneath. So I didn't order that seal, but shouldn't be too hard to get. So let's do the same technique. We'll just drill a little hole right there and see if we can get this seal out. There we go. So there's not a whole lot I can do right now. I don't have the seal. So I did just order one, not the OEM part, actually from Amazon I ordered from. Cause it'll be here in one day. It's 18 hours later and Amazon came through with the seal. So let's get that in place and then we'll fill up the gearbox with oil.
All right, I was aiming for 20 foot-pounds, but it's it's feeling like it's over-torqued wherever I'm at now, so we're going to leave good enough alone. I did put some thread locker on that bolt. I also ordered a couple of new belts from Amazon. Uh, the OEM belts, they were available for about $70 for the both. You know, these should fit. Uh, together, they're about 25 bucks. They definitely don't make it easy to fill. So this is the only funnel I have that actually fits. You know, if I didn't have this, likely I'd have to disassemble that part right there. So I'm going to fill this up with 1.7 liters of gear oil. Then I'm going to let it sit overnight. We'll make sure we have no leaks. And if we're good, we'll get all the covers back on as well as the tines. Well, surprisingly, I overfilled it. You know, I only put a liter in, and I thought it took 1.7, but you can see we're getting quite a bit out the overflow here. So, you know, right now I've got the gearbox nice and level, so I'm going to let that finish draining out the overflow. I'm going to cap it off. We'll clean it up, let it sit overnight, and we'll check it in the morning. Well, it's been a few days. You know, I just parked the tiller over here on a fresh piece of cardboard, and things are looking pretty good. You know, I don't see any signs of leaks. So I'm going to get this back up on the lift and we'll get it fully back together. Just gonna add a little bit of grease to this shaft. You know, it should help the next guy get the tine off should the seal need to be replaced again.
All right, let's give this a try. I've got the wheels locked in. Now, I don't have a garden to try this out on, but I do have the section of yard which has really no grass growing in it. So I'm gonna get the engine started. We'll just put it to the test to make sure both the engine and the gearbox are up to the task. probably help if I turn the fuel on. So it's on now. Let's try it again. Even with the fuel valve on, it's still surging and running lean when under load. So I'm going to open up that main jet a quarter turn and try it again. I'm impressed. This little Troy built Junior, powered by a three and a half horse Tecumseh, had no issues turning up this soil. It did a very good job and better than the tiller I used to own. I actually bought a new Craftsman about 20 years ago at this point and paid a ton of money for it. And that one couldn't touch the way this one tills. So is it worth saving such an old machine? I think so. You know, this one didn't need a whole lot other than a bit of TLC. And now we're back up and running at 100%. So, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.